So our final speaker today in our session on manufacturing is Skylar Tibbetts of the Media Lab. Uh, earlier, Owen Thomas of Read Write expressed doubt in the very existence of 4D printing. Here is the guy who is going to explain it to you today. He's going to show you materials that contain their own code for self-manufacture with a fourth dimension is time. Scott, I'm so pleased you could be with us here today. Thank you. Thanks so much. So I run a research lab here at MIT called the Self-Assembly Lab, and we focus on self-assembly and programmable materials. Hopefully I can explain what those two things are. But I want to first uh, start talking about what has computation done to the way we design things and the way we make things. On the one hand, you could look at um, the explosion of powerful software tools and more powerful computing, and that has really opened up the ability to make massive iterations. So if I want to design something, I can produce many, many solutions and evolve that design space. It's also allowed me to design more and more complex geometry. Similarly, I can then analyze and simulate those solutions. And we've heard of some of those examples today that we could simulate both structurally, thermal, mechanical, et cetera. So we have this huge opportunity to design things we couldn't have designed before. But we also have the ability to communicate with machines. So now we can make things that we couldn't have made before. This is a CNC router, but it could be 3D printing, laser cutter, water jet, you name it. So there's just a huge ability to design and make things that would not have been possible without computation. But what my group focuses on is what happens after this. And I would argue that computation hasn't given us a new vision for assembly yet. That predominantly we still assemble things, all of these complex parts that come off the machine, we still assemble them in predominantly brute force techniques. Taking materials and forcing them together, whether it's a human or whether it's a robot doing that. And so I would argue that we need a new vision for how computation can influence the assembly process. If we look at the industrial sector, construction, manufacturing, the assembly line, product, productization, uh, infrastructure, all these sectors are predominantly brute force in that there's excessive amounts of energy, excessive amounts of human error or uh, dangerous conditions, a lot of money, a lot of time spent on this assembly process at the human scale. But if we look at another scale, if we look at the nanotech revolution, synthetic biology, material science right now, there's a fundamentally different paradigm. There's a revolution happening because we're now able to program physical, synthetic, or biological materials to change shape, change property, compute, and assemble themselves. My favorite example is uh, CAD Nano. There's, there's basically a space opening up for design tools for nanoscale design, 2D and 3D shapes. George Church and Sean Douglas uh, at Harvard Wies Institute showed this drug delivery robot that opens up under certain conditions, releases drugs. This was designed in CAD Nano. And then not only are the, the materials made out of DNA and therefore they're the building blocks, but the materials are the construction technique. The materials have the blueprints. They build themselves. So this is a fundamental shift in the way that we assemble things, that computation is embedded in the material assembly. So I'd like to argue that we need to go from a mindset of pure automation to a mindset of self-assembly. And I don't necessarily mean let's get rid of all robots and let's get rid of all smart machines. Yes, we need smart machines, just like we need smart people. But we also need smarter materials. And those materials can interact with one another. They can analyze conditions. They can make decisions. They can contain information about the assembly process. So what is self-assembly? It's a process by which disordered parts build an ordered structure through only local interaction. So that means the parts can build themselves, find one another, assemble precise structures independently. So what's needed for a self-assembly? We have three key ingredients. On the one hand, we need components. That's materials and geometry. And we have to be tightly focused on what those material properties are, the precision of the shapes, et cetera. On the other hand, we need interactions between those components. So how do they find one another? How do they get from point A to point B? How do they error correct? How do they have that information and attraction embedded in them? And the third thing is that we need energy. So energy is the way that they get from one point to another. It's the way that you excite the system. 
And it doesn't necessarily need to be the traditional sources of energy that we look at in terms of fuel or current, but rather we can use abundant energy sources that are free and around us all the time. Agitation, gravity, heat, pneumatics, fluids, etc. So these energy sources can get your systems excited. So what I'm going to do now is show you a number of projects that have come out the lab, and they're focused on very specific aspects of self-assembly and trying to demonstrate with a wide variety of materials and scales that these uh, tools are at our, uh, that we can use these tools for assembly outside of the nanoscale. The first was done at TED Global with uh, Arthur Olson, a molecular biologist at Autodesk. We built 500 of these glass beakers. Each one in the flask has a different molecular structure, 12 parts, eight parts, four parts, different colors. Uh, we had enzymes, tobacco plant virus, the polio virus. And what happens is you get the flask. This one has the polio virus. You shake it hard, and the parts break apart. And then you shake it a little bit softer, but still randomly, and they come together and assemble a precise structure. And so for me, this demonstrates that through random energy, we can build non-random, highly precise structures. And so it's a different paradigm that the user doesn't know necessarily what they're assembling. We also demonstrated that we can have self-sorting, that we can dump a bunch of yellow and black parts into a chamber, shake them randomly, and the yellow parts make yellow parts, the black parts make black parts, and they never mix, so that they can have the information to separate themselves. At TED Long Beach with Arthur Olson again, we built a much larger version. We called it the self-assembly line, and we were focused on furniture scale objects that could assemble themselves. So we built this large rotating chamber. People would come and spin the chamber, spinning it faster or slower. And by spinning it, you're adding energy. And you start to build this intuition for the process. And the people had no idea what they were building. The people didn't know what it was or how to build it. But the parts inside were able to contain that information. So when they spun the chamber, the parts found one another, and they assembled these furniture scale objects. And for me, this demonstrated that it becomes a tangible medium an intuitive process for a non-intuitive phenomenon. And it opened up this conversation. A molecular biologist, an architect, designer, someone from a totally different industry can have a conversation about self-assembly. And it would quickly lead to drug delivery mechanisms where they, they would say, if this is the polio virus, well, what can I throw into the system to make the polio virus stop assembling? And so it becomes this conversation starter and, and a tangible visual way to understand a new method of assembling things at larger scales. Recently in New York, we did an exhibit called Fluid Crystallization. And we were looking at basically macro scale chemistry or material phase change. So we had 350 of these neutrally buoyant spheres in a 200 gallon tank. You drop the spheres into the tank like this. We can control the turbulence in the system with these pumps in the back that we can program to have either natural or chaotic um, or oscillating energy turbulence in the system. And so you see them assemble, break apart into both regular and irregular structures. If they're all broken apart, you get gas states. If they're, um, if they're kind of fluid in the middle, you get liquid states. And if they're solid and, and crystallized, it's obviously a solid state. Uh, and you get both local and global structures. Locally, everything is deterministic. The structure of the sphere is based on carbon. It has uh, two positive and two negative poles. And they attract to one another in deterministic ways. You get local structures that keep repeating. You get pentagons, hexagons, linear chains, sheets, these kind of structures. But globally, the behavior of the system or the material uh, is, is constantly in flux. And you could look at this on one hand as, as a discovery mechanism. You could say, wow, we could learn a lot about chemistry or biology or material science by studying these physical, tangible devices. Uh, but you could also look at it and say, if we really want to build arbitrarily complex systems in the future using bottom-up assembly processes, we need to understand the complexity of it. We need to understand all of the components. How much control do we need in the energy? How much to control do we need in the components? And this was a kind of a first look at that. The last project that I'm going to show is called 4D printing, and you've kind of heard some hints of that. 4D printing was a collaboration with Stratasys. We're still working on this very actively now. It's the idea that you take 3D printing and smart materials and combine it together. And the reason we called it 4D is because we wanted to add time. That we don't just 3D print things and that's the end of the story, but we 3D print things that then should evolve. They should adapt. They should respond to both me and the environment around. So we use the Connex 
we use the Connex multi-material printer. Uh, deposits two materials at the same time. One of them is a rigid plastic. That rigid plastic is the backbone, it's the angles, it's the limiters, it's the structure, it's the information for what you want to build. And then the other material is a white material that expands 150% in water. And that becomes the energy for it to go from one point to another point. So you get the energy and the information in the system, and you're able to build highly precise structures that adapt. Um, sorry about that. Uh, okay, video's at the end. Um, but basically, you have these materials, they're dipped in water, and they have the two, the two ingredients, the black and the white, and it expands and allows them to fold. I'll show you another demonstration that'll hopefully paint that picture a bit better. Uh, but this is a sequence of images taken from that video. You dip a single strand in water, and it folds highly precise into the letters MIT. And then we have a 3D cube, you saw the end of it there. It self-folds with no human interaction. Uh, we also have a video outside in the lobby that you can see those those videos a bit better. We looked at surfaces. So this is a flat sheet dipped in water here. The water is slightly dirty. It doesn't help it in any way. <laughs> and so over time, uh, this is sped up. It takes roughly 20 minutes. It depends on the temperature of the water. You can speed it up a bit. It folds into this highly precise cube. So you have single strands that can fold, surfaces, 3D objects that can fold. Um, different types of structures that can go from one state to another state where the information and the energy source are embedded in the system. We went a bit larger. We rented out the Z Center at MIT, the Olympic swimming pool. We dipped a 50 foot long strand in the swimming pool. And over the course of an hour, it folds 75 times in linear length. So it folds up into this complex uh, knot. And this is very much ongoing research. But again, it points to two things for me. One, that these techniques may be scalable, that we could build much larger systems with this uh, 4D printing scenario. And two, that we can look at this again as discovery mechanisms. Imagine swimming in the pool and having a huge human scale protein folding next to you and understanding where it gets tangled uh, and where it's folding correctly and not folding correctly. So these become, again, tangible physical interfaces. So where do I think all of this stuff is going? On the one hand, I think this is the paradigm that we're in right now, where we have complex things that go together in complex ways with complex processes, et cetera. And I also want to push that towards a vision of a product's life cycle, where we have materials and uh, products that respond to my performance. They respond to the environment around. So it's when you're running, they become running shoes. When you go on grass, they grow cleats. When it's hot out, your clothes starts breathing. When it's raining, they close up their pores and they become waterproof. These are materials that you can program to adapt in shape and in property. But in manufacturing, that means we can have error correcting systems where the materials build, build themselves and they're more efficient. In shipping, it means that we have flat-packed minimum volume components that are shipped and pop and assemble on, on site. But disassembly, it means recyclability. Parts can separate themselves. It means reconfiguration, that if you don't need this component anymore, it can reconfigure itself into another functional part. It also means repair, that if your parts fail, they can repair themselves. So I'm going to leave you with a quote. I think it sums up the vision of the lab. Can we design material parts with enough information, information and decision making that they can assemble themselves independently uh, and adapt independently to internal and external forces? Thanks so much. Scott Tibbetts. Um, so I love this vision uh, of uh, materials with their own coded intelligence. And you did a nice job, perhaps, sketching out where it's going in terms of applications. Can I ask that a different way? What kinds of big problems would these sorts of smart materials allow us to solve that we simply can't solve today? Um, we've heard a lot today about uh, U.S. manufacturing initiatives and the vision to bring that uh, into a kind of a new, smarter realm for manufacturing. And, and I would say that if you look at those sectors, let's say consumer electronics, mm -hmm. you can fabricate enclosures using injection molding or, or milling processes that are pretty well automated. And electronics, either 3D printed electronics or um, kind of pick and place, the automation is there. But the problem is combining those and mm -hmm. hand assembly basis basically is chasing cheaper and cheaper wages. So if we, if we can have a new vision of how things can assemble themselves more efficiently, uh, that can be a new paradigm for manufacturing. Yeah. 
go to his website, it's got amazing things to play with, <laughs> and what he's talking about becomes very clear when you see the things do them themselves. Scott, that's yeah, lots of fun. Thank so you. Much.